Hi, this is Steve Warona, and you're listening to Campus Public Safety Online from the National Center for Campus Public Safety. Before I introduce today's webinar, here's a brief orientation to the Adobe Connect interface we're using. Your browser right now is showing the title slide for today's talk. On the left side of your screen, you'll see a box labeled Questions and Comments where you can read and type messages. There's a tab labeled Everyone at the bottom of this box, and that's the tab you'll use for all of your general messages, including questions and comments for our speaker. We'll be breaking for discussion several times during the presentation, so please do not hold your questions to the end. You can also send direct messages to a specific person by hovering your cursor over a name in the attendee list. And one of those names is Technical Help, and that's the place to go if you run into technical problems. We're also monitoring Twitter for your questions and comments. Use hashtag NCCPSWebinar, NCCPSWebinar. If you missed part of today's conversation, or if you want to see some or all of it again, this webinar is being recorded and captioned. The link will be available on the NCCPS webinars page in about a week, and watch your email for a link to a brief evaluation survey requesting your reactions and comments on today's session. Please take a minute to respond to that survey when the link arrives. We do appreciate your feedback. And now for a presentation. Back in June, Campus Public Safety Online featured Dr. Marisa Randazzo for a discussion of behavioral threat assessment and the need to keep campuses safe in the face of threats and other disturbing behavior. The survey responses to that webinar were extremely positive and included a number of requests for a follow-up advanced session. So today we're pleased to have Marisa with us once again for a deeper 90-minute discussion of behavioral threat assessment and campus threat assessment teams. Marisa Randazzo is principal and co-founder of Sigma Threat Management Associates and is an international expert on threat assessment, targeted violence, and violence prevention. In addition to her work at Sigma, Marisa currently serves as director of threat assessment for Georgetown University. Previously, she spent 10 years with the U.S. Secret Service, most recently as the agency's chief research psychologist. Among her various responsibilities, she co-directed the Safe School Initiative, a landmark federal study of school shootings that was conducted jointly by the U.S. Secret Service and the U.S. Department of Education. She's co-author of two leading books on threat assessment, The Handbook for Campus Threat Assessment and Management Teams, and Implementing Behavioral Threat Assessment on Campus, a Virginia Tech Demonstration Project. She has testified before Congress and been interviewed by many national news outlets. She received her Ph.D. and master's degrees from Princeton University and her B.A. from Williams College. Marisa was awarded the Williams College Bicentennial Medal for her work in preventing violence and was recently honored as a distinguished alumna of the Spence School. Marisa Rendazzo, welcome back to Campus Public Safety Online. Steve, thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be back. And I wanted to throw in one bit of trivia. The last time that we did this webinar back, or, or another version of this webinar back in June, I was on crutches and uh, bedridden. <laughs> and uh, it was one of the, the few activities I was able to do uh, without a lot of logistics involved with uh, scooters and crutches and uh, someone driving me where I needed to go. So I am absolutely delighted to be back and delighted to be uh, off crutches and uh, fully mobile and very much enjoy the chance to talk with everyone again. Let me go a little bit over what we're going to be going through in the hour and a half that we have together. Um, and one thing I do want to encourage is that we've gotten a, a good number of questions in already when folks registered, but as we go through, we're going to have four different segments of opportunities to ask questions and to discuss issues that are um, of concern to you all. So I encourage you to use the, the question format to submit questions as we go along. Um, and then also we'll be able to, I'll be able to and available to answer questions by email after the conclusion of the webinar. So as we talk about next steps for campus threat assessment teams, we spent a lot of time in June talking about good foundations for setting up and for operating campus threat assessment programs. And what we want to do is really take this to the next level. You may have had a team in place for quite a while. You may have a team that is relatively new. You may have a team that actually has a broader scope or mandate than just campus threat assessment. So there are often challenges that we see teams face as we work with colleges and universities around the country. And, and the we I'm talking about here are the colleagues that I have at, at Sigma Threat Management Associates. But we work with colleges and universities and, and K-12 schools and, and also workplaces 
throughout the United States and internationally as well. And we have seen a, a wide array of challenges that threat assessment teams and programs face once they're up and running. So what we're going to be talking about today is a couple of topic areas listed here. First, just going over the different types of, of teams that may be using a campus threat assessment process, because sometimes there are multiple teams that a college or university may have in place. And the multiple teams can be helpful on the one hand, but it can also create confusion on the other hand. So we're going to be talking about how to work with teams that may have different but sometimes overlapping scopes or jurisdictions, and how to make sure the teams function well together. We're going to be talking about various challenges that are facing threat assessment teams in the higher ed space and different ways to approach how to work around those challenges and how to find workable solutions. The solutions that we're going to be offering today may work for you. Some modification may work for you. I will offer a couple of examples because we have found different colleges and universities find different solutions a better fit for them. I'm going to then talk about some additional challenges that are best served by the involvement of a university or college's general counsel, internal or external, or, and or someone who is serving in a risk manager role for the college or university. These entities and offices within a higher education setting can actually play a very helpful and sometimes vital role in making sure campus threat assessment teams or other teams that use threat assessment get the resources they need, get the access they need, get the support that they need to be able to, to do the work of threat assessment on campus. And then I'm going to talk to you at, at the end about different ways to examine team effectiveness. One of the biggest challenges that campus threat assessment teams face is how to establish that the work they're doing is beneficial, is effective, and uh, as, as we know in this field, one of the biggest challenges is trying to prove the negative. So if you have a campus threat assessment team that is engaged in work and they prevent something harmful from happening, that's often very difficult to demonstrate versus seeing a, a bad outcome, for example. So there are ways that we can get at this that colleges and universities have found useful that may not definitively prove something causal, that, that the team caused this beneficial outcome, but can get very close. And then there are case studies and, and after action analyses we can use to actually show causation, even if we can't do it on kind of a, a large data scale. So at different points in this uh, segment, we're going to have an opportunity for question and answer, as I mentioned before, just so you have a sense of where that will be. Um, we'll be doing one, our first Q&A section in the middle of workable solutions. We'll be doing um, a second one in between at the end of workable solutions before roles of counsel and risk manager. Another one in between uh, roles of counsel, risk manager, and team effectiveness. And then the final one right after summary and Q&A. So I encourage you again to submit questions, and we'll be happy to, to take as many of them as I can. So let's talk about the types of campus teams using threat assessment processes. Um, obviously, we know first and foremost there are named and dedicated campus threat assessment teams. So some colleges or universities will have a team that is labeled a threat assessment team. Now, some of them are student-focused. So there are some entities, colleges, and universities that have teams that just focus on threats or other troubling behavior that may be coming from their student population. Some colleges and universities have separate teams that are dedicated to student-focused concerns and others that are dedicated to employee-focused concerns to include staff and faculty members. There are some threat assessment teams at various colleges and universities that that have one team that tackles an all threats approach. Um, so it's, it wouldn't, be, wouldn't matter what the source is. It could be a student. It could be a parent. It could be a vendor. It could be a, a tenured faculty member. It could be a, an estranged spouse of an employee or student where there's a domestic violence concern. But they may have one team that, that focuses on all of these. Um, so some colleges and universities have threat assessment teams specifically designated as threat assessment teams. But we also see entities that have other teams that may have some threat assessment responsibilities. 
So this includes BIT teams, behavioral intervention teams, and includes care teams that are student focused largely, but some of these have staff or faculty or employee care teams generally. There are other colleges and universities that have what is primarily a crisis response team, but that would take on some threat assessment responsibility because there may be no other entity uh, who would handle a, a threat case, a, a concern about threatening behavior. And then there are some colleges and universities that pull people together as necessary and may do it in an ad hoc manner. So um, you know, there are entities that we work with that say, well, we, just, we know the right group of people to pull together depending on the issue. If it's a concern about a faculty member or a student, we know the right people to pull together, but there's no formal team or, or structure in place. Now, the challenge of having all of these teams is that that can create confusion around team scope. It can create confusion about where a case should be best handled, about whether threat assessment should be involved or not. Um, and in addition to this team scope challenge, we see that, that um, teams are also facing related challenges. So there are teams that believe they have too many cases. They are overwhelmed with referrals and cases and need guidance and assistance for how to manage that volume. There are other teams that um, have sought out our help, for example, if they felt like they have too few cases. And, and oftentimes, the too few means that they are hearing about situations after the situation has been going on for a long time. And they have lost opportunities to, to get involved earlier on. So we'll talk about that. Two other major challenges that we see facing all these different teams on campus is there are some occasions where a team will go from the initial assessment right to case management without any additional fact finding, without any uh, formal assessment, because there's what we call an action imperative. So we'll discuss that in a little more detail. And then we also see that, that there are teams that do a great job of making an assessment of deciding there's a need for some sort of case management or intervention, and even going through and, and articulating what the steps of that case management plan would be, but then failing to implement the case management plan itself. So I'm going to go through each of these individually and talk about sort of how we know when we're facing a problem like that and the solutions that, um, that we have, have found to be helpful for some colleges and universities and that we're sharing here for your consideration. So, um, when we have team scope confusion, that can come from another of factors. It, it can come from the fact that you may have had one existing team, like a care team or a BIT team, that was already in existence, handling student-focused problems or problems about behavior generally. And then the college or university created a threat assessment team in addition to that. Well, when you have a threat assessment team that stood up after a care team or BIT team, one of the challenges that we've seen is there's confusion over who owns what. And the solution can really be to figure out and clearly define the scope of each team. So for example, there was one institution we worked with a, a number of years ago that had had a long-standing care team. And a care team that was really staffed by, by personnel who felt passionately that the work the care team was doing was, was important work. And it was, and it remains important work. But the care team had a, a volume of cases that really didn't allow it to focus on threat assessment in certain cases where there were threats of, of violence or other troubling behavior that raised concern about violence. So there was some confusion when this new threat assessment team came into place over who owns what. And frankly, there was also some human dynamics that came into play so that there was concern about uh, well, we don't want to give up this case. The, the care team folks had been working for so long together as a team. They were a high-functioning team. And so they essentially didn't want to give up ownership of a case to a team that was, had not been in existence for very long, that had not worked well together yet. Not that they couldn't, but they didn't have the same track record uh, and, and interactive dynamic and, and effectiveness that the care team had. So there was some some desire for the care team to continue to, to own and handle all cases, and essentially just to alert the threat assessment team if there was a case they, they didn't want or, or felt um, was, was an imminent risk. So we, as we worked with that university, we had to help both teams in, in one big meeting establish and define their scopes. And, and what they ended up defining was that 
their threat assessment team owned any cases where there was some threat of violent behavior, whether that was in a homework assignment or uh, a communication from one colleague to another or a social media post that was actually threatening language, or there was some other behavior that raised concern about potential violence to others. So again, similar sources here, no matter where it came from, if the behavior or communication raised someone's concern about potential violence to others, then the threat assessment team would handle that case. They also decided that if the threat or concern was only about self-harm, that that would live with the care team, that that would stay with the care team because they had such an established process and effective, robust procedures for handling concerns about self-harm. So if the only concern that was brought forward was about potential self-harm, that stayed with the care team. But if there was any concern about harm to others, it went to the threat assessment team. And similarly, if the care team had been handling a situation that at first glance looked like it was only focusing on self-harm, and then they became aware of some additional information that suggested concern about possible harm to others, at that point, the case would be transferred over to the threat assessment team. One thing that really helped these teams to put those scopes into action was that we helped the, this university make sure there was sufficient membership overlap across the two teams. Now, if you're working at a college or university that has a BIT team and a threat assessment team, or a care team and a threat assessment team, or a case management or, or sort of a, a um, safety net type of team and a threat assessment team, you may see this as well. If there's overlap in membership, it can be very helpful to make sure that a case doesn't go to essentially the, the team that's not as best equipped to handle it, to make sure cases get to the right team. So overlap in membership may mean more work for the individuals involved on both teams, but it can really help ensure that a case that is referred to one team is appropriately resourced, whether it should stay with that team will be sent to, to the other team, care to, to threat assessment, threat assessment to care, et cetera. So overlap in membership can be very, very helpful. And then another thing that can be very helpful to make sure there's no um, confusion about team scope and to make sure there's clarity around these issues can be to task a couple of members, and you can use it from one team or the other or both, to screen cases as they come in and look at the first bit of information to say, all right, does this meet the scope of the threat assessment team? Is the concern here only about self-harm? Okay, given our defined scopes, that goes to the care team. If there is concern about potential violence to others, that goes to the threat assessment team. Now, the, the university that we have been working with and we helped to establish this had been doing well for a while, but after about six months to a year, they took a look at it got together again, both teams, and said, is this working the way we want? And essentially, they took a look and said, well, what we want to do is add a little bit more here. So they added a little bit of a carve out. They decided that any case where a student had been so, um, so ill that they were hospitalized, that they were brought in for an involuntary emergency psychiatric evaluation, for example, or a temporary detention order. Um, any student case where that had been the case, they decided would still live with the threat assessment team, even if the concern was just about self-harm. That they were worried that there was such a level of concern about the student's behavior and that there had been a need for containment and a need for involuntarily addressing the, those medical needs that the threat assessment team would be sure to use threat assessment to look at that subset of cases, even though technically the concern was only about self-harm. So the point here that was very valuable for the, the college, I mean, the university here with the multiple teams was they established some protocols, some procedures for making sure that cases got to the right team. And then after six to 12 months, they took a look and, and got together and discussed how is this working? And do we need to tweak this? Because on paper, it may seem like it's the right way to go. But now that we've had six to 12 months of actually using these procedures, let's talk candidly about whether they're working and whether we need to change them at all. So some other cha challenges facing teams, as I mentioned just a moment ago, was teams that feel like they have too many cases. They're overwhelmed with the volume of cases. Or teams that may feel like they have too few cases. So first of all, how do you know if you have too many cases? Well, I, I mentioned this a moment ago, but 
one of the things that we see is that if teams are just overwhelmed with the volume of referrals that come in, they may feel that they are busy with cases that actually should be handled elsewhere. And they may also realize they've got too many cases if they feel like they don't have enough time or resources to deal with the cases that have concerned them the greatest. So what do you do if you're a team that's facing too many cases? Well, a couple of things. Getting back to that team scope, to defining what jurisdiction that threat assessment team has, or that BIT team can say, on what cases do we want to use this full threat assessment process? When you define that scope, you can then create screening questions to help make sure you are using threat assessment on the right question, on the right cases. So we worked with the university a couple of years ago that was referring all of their alcohol transport cases to the threat assessment team. If a student had been so impaired by um, consumption of alcohol or, or other substances that they required a transport to the local hospital for medical care, the threat assessment team was tackling those cases because there was really no other entity to, to do so. What we helped that university do is say, okay, you may be the only team that's available to look at these cases, but you don't need the full threat assessment process because the concern here is about substance use or substance abuse. It is not about potential violence toward others or dangerousness to others or to self and others. So they still handle those cases, but they didn't have to use the full threat assessment process to do so. Um, if you are uh, using screening questions, say, okay, on which cases are we going to use threat assessment, or which cases go to the threat assessment team, and the threat assessment team still has a high volume of cases, then the workaround here is to triage the remaining cases, to have a couple of members of the team decide, based on the initial report, what seems to need our attention most urgently, what teams, uh, what cases need our immediate care and immediate threat assessment process and, and then to triage and handle the cases in that order. Ultimately, if you're going to use screening questions to figure out where do we need threat assessment or what cases go to a threat assessment team, that screening process itself should be documented if your general counsel allows it to do so. So to make sure that you have some track record and some, some recording of, yes, we were made aware of the situation. But based on our scope, no, it was not appropriate for us to use the threat assessment process or to be referred to the threat assessment team. And also to say, okay, in which case, where did we refer it? Where did it land? The last uh, challenge that we see here before we break for our first question and answer period is how do you know when a team has too few cases? Essentially, the too few cases, in my mind, is really a proxy for cases not being referred early enough to the threat assessment team or early enough for using the threat assessment process. And the way we know that, the way we can tell is if a team, a threat assessment team or a care team or a BIT team is hearing about situations so late in the game where they have been entrenched for so long, where maybe an individual department or silo has been trying to handle these problems on their own and eventually, finally, it comes to the attention of the threat assessment team. We also see too few cases as uh, symptomatic of situations where you have other departments or silos, other processes handling a case that really is best placed within threat assessment or where the threat assessment process should be used. Um, we have seen this with the advent of separate Title IX investigations, Title IX coordinators within colleges and universities because there are such specific albeit now changing, but historically there have been such specific requirements that colleges and universities have faced over the past few years around things that they have to do in a certain period of time where there is some allegation of sexual assault or domestic violence, dating violence, or stalking. So in Title IX slash VAWA cases, sometimes those don't don't get flagged for threat assessment, even though there may be ongoing concerns or safety concerns. Perhaps there's an ongoing stalking situation that a Title IX coordinator is looking into, but that could still benefit from some threat assessment perspective at the same time. So workable solutions for us for colleges and universities where the team feels like they are seeing things too late in the game, or they're finding out about situations being handled strictly by other silos is, again, talking to, uh, to having some individual task members screen cases, 
but also getting back to this concept of creating team overlap and membership. So that if you have, for example, if as a threat assessment team, you invite your uh, college or university's Title IX coordinator, Title IX investigators, to sit in on threat assessment team meetings and to listen to the process, that can help them to know when to flag their own cases for a threat assessment review or involvement. Um, so if you can use your team to do some outreach and some invitations to people from other silos that may be handling these cases, uh, your campus public safety, for example, that maybe there are cases they are so accustomed to handling that they haven't referred to, to threat assessment, but you can involve them more directly in your team meetings and in, in more, more personnel than just your, your campus police representative or campus security representative. But that can be very helpful to um, help to up the number of cases and make sure you're not hearing them so late in the game. And Steve, I think we're at a point for our first Q&A session. Thanks, Marisa. Yes, uh, you are listening. You are listening to Campus Public Safety Online from the National Center for Campus Public Safety. Our guest today is Marisa Randazzo. We're hearing about next steps for campus threat assessment teams. If you have a question or comment from Marisa during this 90-minute presentation, type it into that line at the bottom of the questions and comments box, and we will ask your question during some some scheduled breaks that we have, which we are now in the middle of. And Krista Dillon, Marisa asks, do you have sample screening questions to determine when to move something to an assessment? Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the, the ways that the screening questions that we've used for some teams is really around this focal point of, is there some behavior or some communication that suggests potential violence to others or to self and others? That is really the, the central scope of, of nearly every threat assessment team or process that we have seen around the country, that threat assessment at least would own or take the lead on situations where there is a concern about violence to others or to self and others. Now that concern can come through a number of different ways. So it could be the social media post that is scaring a professor so that he no longer feels com comfortable or safe having that student in class. Or it is behavior by a, a professor who is undergoing tenure review and is acting in a way that's erratic and is scaring uh, her coworkers, for example. So the, the, the behavior or the communication can come to the team's attention in a variety of forms. But essentially, we recommend if there is something central to that behavior or communication that is threatening, that, that, that raises concern about potential violence to others or to self and others, then the threat assessment team should use that indicator to say, yes, we need the full threat assessment process here. Now, it may be that you don't have enough information and you need to, to do a little bit of more information gathering to make that determination. That is fine. Um, but if the concern, uh, the other um, problem that we suggest for screening questions is to also say, okay, if um, you have someone who is so fearful based on this person's behavior that they are now taking steps to protect themselves, then that certainly warrants threat assessment as well. Um, the gray area can come when you have cases where you just have someone, a, a, a faculty member, an employee, for example, who just says, I'm fearful of this person, therefore I don't want to work with them anymore, teach them anymore, supervise them anymore. That can be a matter of, okay, if the threat assessment team has the capacity to take on that case, it can be very helpful to do so. But if there's no clear behavior that you hear from other areas and you are overwhelmed with the volume of cases, that may be a case that you just monitor for a little while. Refer it to other processes, HR, disciplinary matters, a conduct review, and then if there are additional concerns beyond that, then the threat assessment team would engage at that point. One more question for this break. Uh, Buddy Piaster wonders, do you believe that student disciplinary recommendations and referrals should come from a care team, a threat assessment team, or both? So excellent question. Student disciplinary re uh, recommendations or referrals actually can be a critical piece of effective threat assessment. So it, one of the things that we look for in threat assessment is A, to determine does this person pose a threat of violence to others or to self or both. That's the central mission of what a threat assessment team is trying to do. And then the secondary mission is that if the team thinks yes, 
this person does pose a threat of violence to others or self or both, then the threat assessment team makes a case management plan or a threat management plan to figure out how to reduce that risk. A key piece of effective threat management or case management can be looking for points of leverage. Where can we help to encourage this person to moderate their behavior? Where can we help to put some boundaries on this person's behavior and see how they respond to it? So referral for student conduct can be a very effective part of threat assessment, can be a very effective uh, tool for, for a care team as well, but I've seen it done most closely with threat assessment, where the threat assessment team will say, it's going to be important for student conduct to, to pursue these charges. Now, pursuing these charges may also mean, but we think there's some underlying mental health condition, so we will allow the possibility for this person to take a, a voluntary medical leave of absence in lieu of facing charges, and then we're going to give them a grace period to return, and if they return with no more student conduct violations, we can let these original charges you know, disappear be, or be held in, in abeyance indefinitely. So I see student conduct as being a critical piece of an ongoing threat assessment team's engagement, not just a matter of, all right, we think this person poses a threat, therefore let's let student conduct dismiss them and we'll assume that we're safe from that point forward. Threat assessment would still be involved, but often can work very effectively hand-in-hand -hand with student conduct or student discipline. Thanks, Marisa. Keep those questions coming. We're not going to lose them. We've got several more breaks planned. But in the meantime, Marisa, we'll let you get back to your presentation. All right, fantastic. So going down, uh, down the list of the challenges facing teams, um, the next one we have is teams that we see go from initial report right to case management without going through the important threat assessment components of additional fact finding and actually making an assessment, deciding as a team, do we think this person poses a threat of violence to others or self or both? And if not, do they need some other uh, other referral or other intervention. We see this happen often, and we see it happen often going from initial report to case management, often because the people who actually make up a threat assessment team or a care team that's now using threat assessment, for example, the people that make up the team are often people whose own day-to-day -day jobs, their, their daily jobs when they're not sitting on a threat assessment team is to provide assistance to provide employee assistance, to provide student assistance, to provide counseling, to provide some supervision, to provide student conduct. So the fact that we staff our threat assessment teams with people who represent these care-focused and support-focused areas means that it is not surprising that teams actually can be subject to what we call this action imperative, meaning they see a problem and they have ideas immediately as to what can help. Now, the reason this can be a problem or a challenge for teams is because oftentimes with the initial report, we don't have the full story. And we need the full story to know what will make for the best intervention, the most effective case management. So a way to help teams avoid this action imperative, going from initial report right to intervention, right to case management, is to make sure that teams have some procedures or processes that they can follow. So establishing some operating guidelines for a team, and it can be a one-pager. First, we screen the case to see is this appropriate for threat assessment or not. If it is, then we go through the full process. A, we gather more information from multiple sources. B, we're going to analyze the information using some, some well-established questions um, from resources that are available in the field. C, as a team, we make an assessment. Do we think this person poses a threat of violence to others or self or not? And if not, then do we, did they otherwise need some sort of intervention? And D, if we think, yes, they pose a threat or, yes, they need referral for intervention, then we develop our case management or monitoring and referral plan and to make sure we follow those steps. So having some simple operating guidelines like that can be absolutely critical to making sure a team doesn't jump from step one to step four or five or six or however it is on your, on your team's guidelines. You can go through these steps relatively quickly. It doesn't mean that if you think a situation needs some immediate containment by law enforcement or a referral for an emergency psychiatric evaluation or otherwise, it's not that you wouldn't take that interim step to help contain and maintain safety in the situation while you're going through the rest of the process. 
but it does mean that you're going to go through the rest of the process so that if you do have to develop some sort of case management or intervention plan, you're doing so with as much available information, with as full a picture of what's going on as possible. Another way to help guard against this is to really just have a candid conversation with team members about this action imperative, this, this rush to intervention or judgment, so that you can help check each other and make sure someone isn't going from initial re report to case management, albeit likely for the right reasons and with all good intentions. But if you can have a conversation with team members, you can help to, to keep each other from rushing to that action imperative. Another area that, that we can talk about in, in uh, yet another webinar are, are cognitive biases that can affect any sort of team or group working together. Um, but to make sure you're not uh, working on assumptions or biases here, a similar candid discussion among team members about potential biases and decision making can help to guard against that, that really taking hold or taking effect with the team. So, on our first round of challenges facing teams, the last one we want to talk about are teams that actually fail to implement their own case management planning. So one thing that we have seen, and, and this doesn't happen often, but it does happen, are teams that will do a great job in the room, in the meeting, or on the conference call. They may have a weekly conference call. They may only convene a, a meeting or a conference call when they have a case they need to discuss. But we have seen some teams do an excellent job of going through the whole threat assessment process, screening a case, gathering information, analyzing the information, making an assessment, and then making a, a well-articulated case management plan, but then falling short of actually implementing the plan that they've done. Now, sometimes this has happened in, in the colleges and universities where we have seen this. Sometimes this has happened because you may have unclear role assignments. So maybe the team decides, yes, we need to do this, but it is not clear in the meeting or through the conference call who is going to be responsible for doing what. It may be that there are no clear deadlines imposed, so that team members who do know that they are responsible for one piece of the case management plan or for involving the right resources for that piece of the case management plan may not have a clear sense of the timeline in which it is important for them to do so. Or maybe they haven't done a good job of letting the team chair know that they have done their piece of the case management plan and what the outcome was. Um, so it can be challenging, but one of the things that we see is this can actually expose a college or university to, I think, significant liability because they have identified as a team what needs to be done, but then they have failed to do what they need to do. We've even seen some teams we've worked with who've done this because individual team members, once they left the meeting, felt that it was less important, their one piece of the case management plan, and so they didn't feel a need to do it and also didn't bother to follow up with the team to say, I thought about this further once, we, once the meeting was over, and I don't think we need to do this, or I don't think I need to do my piece of this. So then actually can leave a college or university in a tremendously vulnerable position because the team, which has been designed to address concerns about potential violence to others and identify the plan they think needs to be implemented to reduce risk has failed to implement their own plan. So a couple of ways that, that colleges and universities can guard against this as well. A, document the components of the plan. So to make sure you are specific, not just we need to do some stuff to reduce risk, but what are the specific segments? What are the departments you want to get involved? What are the resources you want to refer this person to to make sure this risk reduction can actually happen. Second, make sure you identify individual team members who are going to be responsible for which of those segments and due dates for each segment. And then you need someone to be monitoring the due dates. This is sort of simple project management, really. But to use your team chair, or if your team chair isn't in the best position to do this, use someone outside, like your risk manager or your general counsel, to check in and say, okay, you identified that these three things or seven things need to be done, where are we with that? Who's responsible for doing what and have they actually done so? And what feedback or additional information do those team members have for us? Or do the, does that department chair or head of the counseling center or head of student conduct or head of HR, whoever it may be that you have now asked to be involved for risk reduction, what information or feedback do they have? 
so that not only are you making sure that you are implementing your case management plan, but you're also building in the capacity to monitor how those different segments are working. So that a plan that sounds good you know, on the face of it, uh, in the conference call, in the meeting, is actually having the intended risk reduction effect as well. And Steve, I apologize. I can't remember if we're at a. I don't think we're at a, a question. Yep. No, we were. We yeah. We uh, right. Uh, breaking after nineteen. So so that is now, and that's fine. Jean Jean Griffin wonders. Do you recommend that the mandatory assessments for students who have engaged in behavior that is threatening to others be done by an off-campus clinician, or can campus-based providers make the assessment? Okay. Excellent question. And, and let me um, get some points of clarification in here. Um, there's often confusion about what a threat assessment team does versus a, a clinician, a psychologist or a psychiatrist who may be engaged to do a violent risk assessment or more of a forensic evaluation or a full evaluation of, of someone's mental health status. So threat assessment really is considered to be best practice for looking at potential concerns about violence to others or violence to self and others, meaning that colleges and universities, there's an American National Standard here that I won't get into, but the, the American National Standard talks about different hazard planning for colleges and universities, and they recommend that every college and university have a threat assessment team to address concerns about behavior uh, that, that may be threatening or that raises concern about potential violence. So if there's a, a worry about potential violence to others or self and others, you should have a threat assessment team, and they should use threat assessment to look at that situation. Separate from that, it can be very helpful to involve a psychologist or a psychiatrist to do a violence risk assessment or to do a full psychological evaluation about a student or about an employee to get a full sense of what's going on with that person because their behavior is raising concern. But that is separate from what the threat assessment team would do. So if a threat assessment team says, yes, this would be very helpful for us to know these things, then um, I have seen most colleges and universities prefer to do that with an external provider for a couple of reasons. One, oftentimes counseling centers simply don't have the capacity to be doing these types of evaluations along with all of the, the hands-on care that they are doing for their student population or an EAP program for employee and, and for faculty and staff, for example. Second, if there's a, going to be a concern at all that the, the person who's going through this evaluation is going to argue that the college or university has to accommodate them because of a, a, a disability that's a mental health related disability, it is much more helpful to have some third party, someone external to the college or university do that evaluation so that the college or university isn't being accused of some conflict of interest. Well, you had your own counseling center do this and you wanted to dismiss me anyway instead of accommodating my mental health condition, of course they're going to find that, that I, I had X, Y, and Z or I couldn't be accommodated. So for a number of reasons, it can be very helpful to do so. Um, one thing I will caution, though, if you're going to involve an external mental health evaluator, my recommendation is to look for one now if you don't already have someone you know in the community who could do this for the college or university. It is much better to be able to take some time and use your counseling center staff, use your EAP staff to help you identify people in the community that would be good, that know what they are doing. The second caveat here is if you are going to refer someone for any external evaluations, that the evaluators can do a much better job the more information they have from the college or university about all the behaviors that have raised concern, extenuating circumstances, et cetera, so they've got all this additional information. And evaluators can do a, a better job the more precise an evaluation question you have. So it's important for teams to understand the difference between a violence risk assessment, for example, which looks at someone's risk of impulsive violence, losing their temper and, and engaging in violence, um, versus a fitness for duty. Is this person capable, stable enough to fulfill the functions of their job, for example? So again, you can use your, your counseling center staff to help you craft precise evaluation questions, but I've seen most colleges and universities prefer to go to an outside provider. And last bit of answering that question is that it can be very helpful if a college or university can offer to foot the bill for that evaluation so that requiring a student or an employee to go through an evaluation doesn't also incur additional financial stress 
at the same time. So these are questions that are good to be able to ferret out in advance of needing a resource like this to know who would pay for it, do we have the capacity, who do we have available, and what type of precise evaluation questions and information can we get to that provider. A couple of related questions have come in from Robin Cook. Can BIT teams mandate mental health evaluations of students? And from B. Foster, can a clinical social worker in LCSW do the assessment and evaluation? So on the first question, can BIT teams, and I'll, and I'll do a related care teams or threat assessment teams, mandate a psychological assessment? I have seen that done quite well. The distinction I've seen is that they don't necessarily go so far as to mandate treatment. The way that I've seen that evaluations mandated by a BIT team or threat assessment team or care team actually usually goes through your normal student conduct procedures. So it may be that you've got that leverage point I was talking about before, where someone has actually violated the student code of conduct or violated something in the employee handbook that gives the college or university some leverage through their disciplinary channels, through student conduct or through HR, for example, to then say, look, we have seen some, some significant violations of our code of conduct. We believe, or you have suggested, there is some mental health component behind this. In order for us to fully understand what's going on and to fully address these violations and fully support your needs and the, and the college or university's safety needs, you have to go through this evaluation. So I have seen evaluations mandated often with great success because they can yield very helpful information that can help a threat assessment team or a, a counseling center, for example, know how best to support and treat this individual going forward and to allow a college or university to know what accommodations are feasible and are, and are workable and practical and, and effective. Um, but I have seen very, very few colleges and universities go so far as to require treatment, especially not through their own counseling center. Um, college, uh, psychologists and psychiatrists, understandably so, are often not necessarily skeptical, but, but concerned about treating someone who has been forced into treatment, because you just don't have the same quality of, of therapeutic alliance. And, and of real engagement by the client or the patient because they want to get help. They're being told they have to get help. So we can, we can mandate evaluations effectively. We're not, it is not as effective to mandate treatment. It is now not out of the question. You can put in a behavioral contract that requires someone to engage in certain measures, including requiring them to seek some treatment. Um, in order to, to maintain employment or maintain enrollment, for example. Um, but I, I understand that, that many psychologists and psychiatrists are um, just wary and cautious about uh, treating someone who has been forced into treatment, that they don't have the same, same quality of engagement that people who, who are seeking treatment voluntarily do. Thanks, Marisa. Uh, we are going to save the rest of these questions for the next break, uh, but to keep you on your timeline, we'll let you get back to your presentation. Excellent. All right, so we're moving on to a few more challenges that, that teams face that can be particularly um, effective to involve uh, college or university's general counsel or their risk manager or both. Um, and these are things that, that are, are more sort of external to threat assessment teams but can really impact the threat assessment process. Uh, so this is where having someone outside or, or some advocate can be very helpful. Um, first is misconceptions about threat assessment, uh, what it is and essentially what it isn't. Um, we often still see pervasive misunderstanding of FERPA, which is the, um, the federal regulations that protect privacy of students' educational records. Um, HIPAA, which is uh, HIPAA and state laws, federal and state laws that protect the confidentiality of medical and mental health records and conversations with treating providers. Um, and then also disability law, federal and, uh, and state laws as well. Um, we also see that sometimes threat assessment teams or BIT teams or care teams that are engaged in threat assessment bump up against problematic campus policies or procedures that may be actually exacerbating problems, creating problems that are, that are not necessary or don't provide them the leverage that, that teams could really benefit from. And then we also see teams facing documentation challenges. So all of these are areas where uh, general counsel or risk managers can be involved and play an important role. So let me go through these one by one. 
So helping to address misconceptions about threat assessment. There is still a lot of misunderstanding at various colleges and universities about what threat assessment is. We're seeing this still in the K-12 domain and on the, in the wake of um, the high school shootings in Parkland, Florida and uh, Santa Fe, Texas last spring, for example, and, and the mass shootings that we have seen this year. There's still some misunderstanding about what threat assessment is and what it isn't. There are people that still worry that this is profiling or that if I refer the students from my class to the threat assessment team, it's like a star chamber process, and all of a sudden the student will be gone. But I've got a good relationship with the student. I don't, I don't want to risk that. So it can actually be helpful for someone outside the threat assessment team, like a risk manager or general counsel, to help to craft and then publicize frequently asked questions about threat assessment. I may have mentioned this previously, but there are a couple of colleges and universities um, that really have some excellent uh, frequently asked questions posted on their threat assessment web pages. Um, probably the one that I've seen that's most thorough is at Virginia Tech. So if you go to, I think the website is threatassessment.vt.edu. That is Virginia Tech's threat assessment page um, or pages. And they have been quite clear that you are free and clear and encouraged to take information off of their website for your own use at your college or university just as long as you give proper attribution that the original information came from the threat assessment web pages at Virginia Tech. But they have a great, fairly thorough list of frequently asked questions that I think you can download as a, as a PDF if I recall the, the, um, the format. And that help to answer people's questions about what is threat assessment, help to correct misconceptions and myths about what threat assessment isn't, um, and help to make sure people are aware of, of what, what happens when you alert the threat assessment team or express a concern or report a person or a situation to the threat assessment team. So to help make clear what that process is and also what it is not. Um, it can also be helpful for general counsel or risk managers, again, outside the team, but, but working in concert with the team, to help uh, promote some additional awareness through you know, quick um, information at a faculty senate meeting, for example, uh, a email reminder to all employees, to all faculty and staff about threat assessment and how to access it. So it can be helpful for the team to do this, but also can be helpful for counsel and risk managers to, to take a role as well. Similar to um, addressing misconceptions and misunderstandings about, about FERPA, it can be very helpful, especially if general counsel can put out a quick, easy to read document in English language, you know, sorry, in, in, in plain language, whatever language you want to use, but in plain, non-legalese, non-jargonistic terms about what, do you have to worry about or not worry about in terms of sharing information? There are a number of, of exceptions within FERPA, for example, um, that allow for sharing of information, first of all, easily in any situation among uh, university uh, employees in the course of their duties. But second, if there's a concern about uh, potential for, for a health or safety emergency, FERPA allows information to be shared that ordinarily would be protected, would be confidential, but it, information can be shared to help figure out is there actually the potential for a health or safety emergency, meaning threat assessment can figure out does this person pose a threat, and if so, to reduce that risk. So there are lots of ways that information that faculty member might assume is protected and that they cannot share actually can be shared. One of the big things that general counsel can help in terms of of the misconceptions and myths is really to help explain what is not covered by FERPA. That uh, something a student says in the classroom is not confidential educational records. Um, something that's overheard, a behavior that's observed, is not part of a student's confidential education record. So that that information is free and clear to be shared with a threat assessment team or anyone else for whatever reason. Also, something that can be reassuring to faculty especially, as I've seen this work, is that faculty members are, are often concerned that they could be sued as an individual for a FERPA violation. So one thing general counsel can help to clarify is that it, the only entity that really has 
standing to, to bring a, a, a cause of action for a FERPA violation is the U.S. Department of Education, and that their focus is going to be on the institution, not on an individual. So that, that an individual faculty member cannot successfully be sued for a FERPA violation. That this is something that, um, that it would be an institutional level concern. And also, general counsel can help to explain to individual faculty and staff members how their office could be a resource if a faculty member has a question and they're not sure if they can share information, who can they call within general counsel's office to get clarity about that so they know what to do. Counsel and risk managers can also play a role in addressing issues about problematic campus policies and procedures. And let me give you an example. There, there are a um, couple of universities and colleges that my team and I at Sigma have been working with over the years that have excellent, robust student codes of conduct. It's very clear in articulating behavior that is unacceptable, that may be subject to punishment, what that punishment might include. Um, very clear about behavioral expectations, whether in the classroom, in the residential halls, in public spaces, uh, online even. Uh, so there, is, there are some excellent examples of, of student codes of conduct and student handbooks out there. There are other colleges and universities that have similarly strong, maybe not as strong, but similarly strong approaches to staff behavior, non-faculty behavior, similar uh, employee or staff codes of conduct. But yet there, there are some colleges and universities that no matter how robust and detailed and, and well articulated their code of conduct may be for students or for, and or for staff, they fall short of having the same types of behavioral expectations for faculty members, especially not for tenured faculty members. And uh, there's one university that I, I've worked with on a couple of occasions that have a very clear behavioral expectations for students and for staff about how students and staff should behave. And their handbook for faculty is about how faculty should be treated and says nothing about how faculty should behave. And this is sort of a holdover from, from a different dynamic and, and time, but for a threat assessment team can prove to be a real challenge that the leverage points that they may have for a student case or a staff case may not exist if they see the same behavior in a faculty member. So general counsel and risk managers can take a, a, a vital role here, here in, in helping to look at whether certain policies or codes of conduct or handbooks may need to be updated to actually be able to give threat assessment teams the tools they need to handle concerning behavior no matter who may display that behavior, whether students or staff or faculty. Um, and this can actually be a, a very helpful tool for, for provosts and for offices of provost staff to, to be able to use to handle, for department chairs as well, that sometimes what you, what you see as you start to look into and update these policies and, and handbooks, for example, for faculty in particular, is that department chairs have felt like they don't have the right tools they need to be able to address concerning behavior, even if it falls short of potential for violence. But if it's harassing, if it's overly aggressive, if it's inappropriate, if it's unprofessional, that helping to update these policies and handbooks can give those frontline supervisors tools that they don't already have. Some other areas where general counsel and risk managers can play an important role, um, especially in, in the areas that are impacting threat assessment teams, uh, is helping to review those operating guidelines we were talking about a moment ago. So we're talking about them with respect to how to help teams avoid jumping from initial report right to intervention without going through the threat assessment process itself. General counsel and risk managers can help to review those. Now, I know that there are some general counsels who would prefer not to call them standard operating procedures, and I completely understand that. If you call something a procedure, you are bound to follow your own procedures, and it is a problem if you fail to follow your own procedures. But you can get the same, the same effect by doing a step-by-step -step process that you call a process guideline, a, a general threat assessment guideline, threat assessment process, that doesn't tie your hands by saying this is a procedure you must follow in every single case, but helps to serve as a workflow so that a team knows, I want to make sure we don't miss a step. I want to make sure that we can demonstrate 
we have followed this progression, this process, these guidelines that we have in place. And sometimes guidelines are, are easier and more flexible to amend as needed, to update or tweak as a team needs to, than something that might be codified in, in policy, for example, or in a standard op operating procedure. Having these guidelines can also be helpful if you have um, a, a large university that has multiple teams, for example. We work with a number of, of universities that have teams that serve different teams serving different aspects of the um, of the educational institution. So there might be one team for their law school, one team for their business school, one team for their medical school, and a different team for their undergraduate population. You want to make sure that, that you are following the same general process across these teams, even if the people involved are different, even if the the resources they have available differ from team to team, you really want to make sure there is some standardization or some uniformity in how the teams are handling these situations. So using your general counsel or your risk manager to help take a look at what are each of your teams doing or what process is your team following, make sure it's got all the necessary areas um, as reminders, as workflow reminders for your team when they're working a particular case. Because whether it's an action imperative or whether it's because the, the threatening situation is escalating rapidly or deteriorating rapidly, it can be easy for a team to jump into action, to miss a couple of steps, and to not have the full benefit of information gathered and analyzed to make their intervention decisions. So having this, these process guidelines can help for a number of different aspects of threat assessment. Similarly, uh, general counsel really has to be the one to weigh in on what type of documentation do we want our threat assessment team to keep, and where does it live? Um, similarly, if, if you're using a care team or a BIT team that uses threat assessment only on a subset of its cases, how do you want to document that the threat assessment process was followed for that subset of cases? So this is absolutely a decision for general counsel. They are the ones who defend an institution's documentation or lack thereof. They're, they're the ones who really need to provide some guidance for a team as to what you document, how you document, where does it live. I will give you some general guidance about documentation. A, documentation is, is more helpful than not, typically, because sometimes these situations are handled well and intervened with for a while, and the situation looks like it's fully resolved, or at least it's being well managed. And then a year or down the road, two years down the road, six years down the road, the situation could come back to the team's attention. The more documentation you have about what worked previously, what was done previously, and, and with what effect, the, the further ahead of the curve the team will be in addressing the, the new iteration of the concern. Second, documentation really helps to demonstrate that a team did its work, that it followed the threat assessment process, that it did what it was expected to do. And even if, and we hope it doesn't happen, but even if there is some sort of violent outcome, it can be tremendously helpful for the college or university to be able to demonstrate we did what we were supposed to do here. Once we became aware of the situation, we gathered additional information, we did a full analysis, we followed these assessment questions, we took steps to intervene. We engage in threat assessment to do everything we can to prevent violence, to reduce the likelihood of violence. But we also need to be able to show in case after case that we were doing this with care and in following a process. So documentation can help us do that as well. And then your counsels and your risk managers can actually be a critical connector for the team. They can help teams get resources that they may need in very short order that the, the team chair or individuals on the team don't have the same access to be able to secure. And they can also serve as advocates for the team as well. Um, so we worked with a, a college a number of years ago that um, wanted to get some financial assistance to a student, a student who, had a, who was supposed to be receiving a refund for a couple of courses, and the refund got delayed. And it was right before the holidays, and the student was feeling despondent, and, and the financial stress was making their situation far worse. So one of the things that the, the threat assessment team, there were also other concerns about potential violence because the student had a, a, a veteran status. And so you had faculty members who, because the student had served in the military, felt fearful of the student, unreasonably so. But they felt so fearful that they didn't want to engage with the student further, and the student was also feeling increasing stress as a result of some missteps by the college. 
So the threat assessment team used their general counsel and the risk manager to help secure some emergency financial assistance for this student until they could get the refund fully processed. And at the same time, use the threat assessment process to determine there was no risk posed and to get some other care and resources and counseling from department chairs and from EAP to those faculty members who were fearful of the student just because of the student's veteran status. So the team was able to, to, to do a lot, but the team needed outside help to be able to get access to, to that financial assistance as quickly as it did. And so general counsel, and risk manager would play a vital role in, in doing that. So thinking about things that impact the team generally. Can, we can, we, we've talked so far about situations that impact the team where the team can implement some workable solutions. And we've also talked about features and systematic issues, policies and procedures and misconceptions that may be impacting the work of the team that can actually best be served by someone external like general counsel's office or a risk manager. And we were going to take a question break here. Yep, absolutely. Shall we do that? Um, yep. You actually just you actually just touched on this, but this question came in some time ago from Eli Hotchkin. What are some strategies that you employ to address continued and excessive fear when the team has deemed that the threat at this time is low risk? That's an excellent question, and this happens a fair amount, especially if you have a a faculty member who is particularly fearful of a student, for example, or a, a supervisor fearful of, of someone in their department or coworker upon coworker, that using the threat assessment process can be a necessary but sometimes not a sufficient condition to help address someone who is experiencing that extreme fear. So it's really important to have the threat assessment process engage, and those are cases where we think it's important to go through that full threat assessment process, not just the screening, because someone is so fearful of someone else's behavior or someone else's mere presence in the classroom or presence in the residential hall or presence in, in the department, for example. So you can use your threat assessment process to look at it. Is there any threat posed to others or to self or both? Is there any otherwise need for intervention even if there's not a threat posed? And if the team is able to do its work and says, no, there's not a threat posed, and no, there's no other need for, for real intervention, then it comes down to managing the fear that those other individuals are still experiencing. The threat assessment process itself can help to uncover what the basis of that fear may be. Um, so I worked on a case with a, a university a long time ago with a, um, a, an administrator who had sort of this, as I was just mentioning in a similar case, the sort of fear of people who had a veteran status. Her perception was that someone who had come back from a deployment and was now engaged in, in coursework likely had some sort of PTSD or likely had some um, some head trauma that, that would lead to violent behavior and that she would be at risk challenge was that, that we all, we found out through the threat assessment process that the way the behaviors that she displayed in engaging with that subpopulation of students over whom she was an administrator was different than students who didn't have a veteran status or the students that had a veteran status but didn't disclose it to her. So the irony was she was actually engaging in behavior that was provoking a confrontational response from these students, and she would then point to that confrontational behavior. See, they're regressive, they're confrontational, they're going to be violent toward me. So part of what helped was we, we used the threat assessment process in a couple of cases that, that came forward where she was involved. We were able to identify there was no threat posed. But the fact that we now had her involvement in not just one but multiple cases showed us there's something going on here that we got to look into further that this team got to look into further as we coached them and identified, okay, that there was something about her behavior and there was something about her own perceptions and fear that was driving this. So with her particular case, a couple of things happened. One, it was important to work the threat assessment process and all of this, but two, we um, were able to get her um, her uh, dean overseeing the administrative work that the administrator work that she was doing um, to talk with her and sort of counsel her about the importance of treating all of her students with the same type of behavior, but B, 
Um, we also used the employee assistance program to connect her with some, some resources and care. And, and the, the angle that, that I found helpful that, that as we coached the team and the team was able to um, kind of work with her directly, that the, the approach that ended up being most helpful with her was that her immediate um, supervisor went to her and said, as this threat assessment process is going on, this first time or the second time, whatever case that she had brought forward, this can be stressful for any faculty or staff member who is going through this. We want to make sure you are connected with the right care and the right resources as this process is still going on. So we want to make sure that you can access and this, this EAP program, for example. And so they helped to encourage her to get connected to care. After the third case, when it was clear there was something about her behavior, then her, um, I think it actually was someone from the provost's office, was able to engage with her and say, look, there's actually some theme that we're seeing here. There's something about the way in which you are perceiving these situations or interacting that is making you particularly fearful. And so let's talk about different ways that we can solve that. Um, and so she ended up taking a, a, a leave of absence and, and getting some care, and I think it was, it was very beneficial for her. But the threat assessment process was necessary, A, to rule out risk. Right, that, that someone actually posed a threat, and B, to help identify what are these underlying issues that are, are impacting it here, that, that may be um, creating some concern. When I have someone who remains very fearful, despite a full threat assessment and assurance that all these steps were followed, that no threat is posed, um, that oftentimes we need to do some additional care. So it may be suggesting they get connected with something like EAP. It may be offering on a short-term basis some additional patrols by campus police around their classroom. It may be about offering them an escort to and from their car. It may be allowing them, again, on a short-term basis, a chance to do some, some teleworking or, or change their office hours or change their office hour locations, for example. So you can offer some interim measures as the process is unfolding. You can then use the results of the process to help them to understand that there may not be a concern. But even those cases, there may be some situations where even that is not sufficient to allay their concern. And so there may be some other direct counseling and conversations with that person that can be helpful to pursue. Marisa, a couple of related questions, and, and this is going to be the end of the questions for this break. Um, from Dewey Cornell, do you think that threat assessment teams should handle cases that involve a threat to self without a threat to others? And Peter Levinas wonders, we have observed that some campus teams seem to confuse threat assessment with mental health evaluation and refer every threat assessment case for mental health assessment before making a decision about potential for violence. Can you clarify for the webinar audience how threat assessment differs from mental health assessment and why most threat assessment team cases do not require mental health evaluation in order to determine if a person is on a path toward violence? Thanks. All right, two excellent questions. And Dewey, I love that this question came for you about self-assessment. I just read your paper on the uh, comparing uh, suicide assessments to threat assessments within Virginia K-12 schools. So Dewey Cornell has an excellent publication that, that recently came out about that, so I encourage you to, to look at that. Um, for the, the threat assessment team scope, it really is a matter of a, of a team deciding at the outset if they will handle cases where there is concern only about harm to self and do a suicide assessment. A lot of colleges and universities already have solid, robust procedures and resources already available to them that they've been using with success to address cases where the only concern is about self-harm. If you already have those procedures and processes in place, I don't see a need for a threat assessment team to take those over. The threat assessment team should know what they are, know how to access them if they need to, know, have a good point of contact and an after-hours cell phone number as, as they need it for in case that's something they need for intervention in one of their cases. But for colleges and universities that have them, whether for students or for employees or both, have good solid procedures for addressing concerns just about suicide, there's no need for a threat assessment team to take those over. Now, there are certainly colleges and universities that don't have that. Um, and that's where having the threat assessment team be able to modify their procedures for a concern just about harm to self can be very important if the college and university has no other resource available to address those concerns. But for those that already do, I think it's fine to keep them separated. Um, on the issue of referring all threat assessment cases for some mental health evaluation, I have seen this in, in a, a handful of colleges and universities around the country where they would approach 
um, the, a threat assessment would involve a mandatory referral of the student, for example, for four sessions at their counseling center for some sort of mental health evaluation. Here's the challenge. Threat assessment cases sometimes involve mental health concerns, oftentimes don't involve mental health concerns. If we focus just on behavior, which is what the process is designed to do, then we're focusing on, on the right assumption. That behavior may lead us to say, it would be really helpful to have a mental health evaluation in this case, but it should be the behavior and the analysis of the threat assessment team that's leading to that determination rather than it being an automatic concern. The other challenge that I've seen is, is when a college or university says, well, every case referred to the threat assessment team has to be referred for a mental health evaluation, that actually could be putting the college or university in a difficult position because you are treating that person who has been referred to the team as if there is a mental disability, even if there may not be one. So if you are treating them as if there is a, a mental health disability, they may be afforded protections under disability law that they wouldn't ordinarily get. And you may not be able to dismiss that person or suspend that person or terminate that person as readily if, as if you were just focusing on behavior. So I would check very closely with your general counsel's office if your institution is already is referring all threat assessment cases for mental health evaluation. So similar to a violence risk assessment, it can help inform in some cases, but first and foremost, threat assessment should be, should be focused on behavior and then seeing what behavior suggests would be helpful in terms of further evaluation or intervention resources. Thanks, Marisa. We're in the home stretch. Back to you. All right. So now we're getting into to different tactics that teams can use to examine their own team effectiveness. Um, there are a couple of different ways to do this, and, and how you do it and if you do it should be a team-by-team -team decision. Um, but again, this can be something that your general counsel and, and risk manager can play a role in, in helping you to, to, to um, actually make a reality if you want to. One is just a, an annual team discussion, a candid discussion among all team members um, can be done on campus, can be helpful if it's done off campus, um, can, can be combined with an end of year celebration, we got everyone over the finish line <laughs> after a graduation type of an event. But having some type of a, a chance for the team to discuss individual cases or just discuss how things are working and in a way that is sort of safe and candid can be really helpful for for um, improving team effectiveness going forward, identifying areas that are problematic. Doing these team discussions, I think, are best run by an external facilitator. And it doesn't have to be external to the college or university, but, but external to the team, um, so that the team chair can, can participate in things candidly. The team chair doesn't feel like um, she or he is, is being uh, unfairly criticized or <laughs> sort of left holding the bag with everything. But if you can get someone who can facilitate a candid discussion, hey, what went well this, this year? Um, and what do we want to do better? Uh, and where do I, as an individual team member, feel like I'm, I'm facing challenges or don't feel as supported um, or felt like I had to handle most of the cases myself? So all those things can help because if you can tweak those, especially sort of at the end of the, the academic year and allow some time for people to think about some creative solutions over the summer before you gear up for the academic year. It's not that the work of a threat assessment team goes completely dormant in the summer. Um, some teams don't see much change at all. But for many teams, they can see at least a, a lower volume of case concerns over the summer that allow for this type of, of evaluation and tweaking. Similarly, you can have teams discuss specific cases and do an after-action analysis about a particular case. And these can be cases where you felt like the team handled the situation really well, as well as cases where you, you really want to make sure you avoid doing the same mistakes again. These can be self-run by a team chair um, or, again, by an outside facilitator if you really want the team chair to be sort of an equal member in, in the discussion. You can also bring in external consultants to review your process. Um, to review how cases are documented, how team meetings are run. Um, and that can help identify ways to improve the effectiveness of the team. We worked with a, a, a college a number of years ago and they had a very good team, but they had real hierarchy on the team. So they had a, um, a, a vice president serving on the team who oversaw um, and was a su direct supervisor to a number of other team members. And so that team discussion was, was kind of hindered among that team. And, and so one of the things that, that we helped this college to identify is that 
that vice president was was a great advocate for the team, but actually serving as a, an equal team member was did not allow the other members of the team to speak as freely. Um, so that they they um, looked to serve move that vice president to more of a, a oversight role for the team itself and served as a, in a wonderful advocate position uh, in doing so and then allowed the team to have candid conversations among their sort of peers and with not without the hierarchy uh, involved. It can be very important uh, to make sure any training events that a team goes through you document. So even if you can't prove that we prevented this, this, and this from happening, you can prove the underlying efforts that make for an effective team. So we do this threat assessment training on an annual basis. We run through a tabletop exercise once a semester. We do some general awareness training for different segments of the, of the college or university community on different years. Whatever you can document in terms of efforts you are making to raise awareness, efforts you are making to go through training, um, even advanced training that individual team members may go to or conferences they participate in. Are they members of ATAP, for example? Do they attend the annual ATAP conference, regional ATAP meetings, wherever the case may be that you can document these are things our team is doing to train, to get more knowledge, to be active in professional associations can be very effective to demonstrate effectiveness of the team and also to demonstrate that the team is really being consistent with current best practice. And then there are ways that you can do feedback or, or surveys of, um, of constituents who may have used the team. You can do campus-wide surveys to see if people even know that the team exists or what the team would handle or how to access the team if they need to. So you can do general awareness and you can do um, individual feedback with, with departments that have used the team, for example, or individuals who have uh, reported someone to the team or had a situation handled by the team to get a sense of, of from a customer service standpoint, what the experience is like to work with or have a situation handled by your threat assessment team, as well as what your general awareness is. And then if you are going to do some sort of an annual review or discussion or have someone come in and, and review your threat assessment process, here are some areas that can be helpful to look at. Um, one, to just get people's opinion about what's working well. This is really a strength-based approach, and I'm a huge fan of this. I don't want to disrupt something that's already working well on the team, right? So I don't want to, I don't want the team to take over a mission that is already served well by a different department and isn't necessary for the team to be involved in. Similarly, I don't, I don't know what, um, I don't know, uh, I don't want to make, I want to make sure that anything that is working well on the team, we keep and we don't disrupt that. We also want to look at what are the gaps for ob obtaining referrals. Are there areas where you're not getting things referred? Areas where, um, where you have heard about things too late in the game. So similar to what we talked about with two few cases, are there sections of the college or university that you're simply not hearing things from? And it might be good to go back and, and do some general awareness reminders. Um, are there places where you're having a hard time gathering information? Uh, are there areas where you're having a hard time implementing case management, um, whether it's implementing the case management plan or monitoring how things are going? And similar to what we talked about in the beginning, take a look at what your current scope is. Are you screening question? Are you screening cases the way you want to? Do you need to change the scope? Do you need to change the screening questions? How are they working? Uh, last couple questions to keep in mind are, are what skill sets and resources are needed on our team but we're still missing, whether on the team on a regular basis or as an ongoing resource? Um, how could we improve the, the process overall? And are there any of these overarching policies or procedures, whether directly affecting the threat assessment team or that are maybe impeding the work of the threat assessment team that could be beneficial? So just a quick summary as we go to our last uh, Q&A. Um, we know threat assessment is considered to be best practice for preventing violence on campus. But having a team is, is not all that we need. We need to make sure that the team is functioning well, that the processes that they're following are, are thorough, um, that we're helping to identify and address myths and misconceptions that may still exist on campus, and that we're enlisting the help of general counsel and risk managers where we need to. Above all, it's okay to, to seek out feedback from within your team and from others outside your team. We can really use criticisms and, and use critical feedback to make a team and a process work better, we shouldn't fear them. Um, and also, there are so many colleges and universities that, that do this well around the country. Feel free to reach out to, to peers at other institutions and see what they're doing, what problems they've solved, what resources they've identified, et cetera. Steve, I think that's it for, for my section there. 
Tremendous. Uh, let's squeeze in as many of these as we can in the couple minutes we have left. Sharon Reynolds wonders, do you have experience with employee-focused teams where immediate actions recommended for a tenure facu tenured faculty are constrained by shared governance? Actions must go through statutory or constitutional process. What I've seen works very well with tenured faculty, regardless of kind of the shared governance, et cetera, can actually be involving uh, someone um, sort of at their level or slightly above who, who they respect, a department chair, either in their department or another, a, a dean, someone in the provost's office. So sometimes the soft work around the tenured faculty can, can be a more effective and more immediate way to address behavioral concerns colleague to colleague than going through a, a standard process is. Laura Bennett wonders, I'm seeing an increase in cases that overlap with Title IX and threat assessment teams, i.e. dating violence, domestic violence, stalking, often where the perpetrator is not affiliated with the campus but the victim or target is. Other than collaborations with Title IX staff and local rape crisis or domestic violence agencies, do you have ideas or resources for managing these risks? Yeah, and this can be, this is an excellent question as well. Um, there is often a Title IX or VAWA slash threat assessment overlap, and sometimes it's in cases where there, there isn't sort of jurisdiction ownership, so Title IX doesn't own much in terms of where the perpetrator is, um, but, but only with the victim. This is where local relationships can be absolutely vital. So local relationships with, uh, with local law enforcement between your campus police or campus security, your threat assessment team, your Title IX personnel, and, and local law enforcement, knowing what, what resources there may be, because sometimes all you can do is support a, a victim or a survivor in, in a case like this. Um, but sometimes we have seen areas of, of the country uh, where you have perpetrators go from, from university to university. Um, we, we have a lot of colleges and universities concentrated in the Washington, D.C. area, and we've had cases where it's been very effective to have some liaison relationships with other Title IX staff and other institutions because that person was recently with their institution as well. So even if you don't have the direct impact, um, what it can be very helpful to do from a Title IX perspective, you might have your hands tied in terms of not being able to really kind of um, address a, a, a complaint about someone that you um, that is you know within your community, for example. Um, but you can help connect the, the person who is victimized with the right resources. And then use your threat assessment team to take a threat assessment approach and see is this, um, is this something where threat assessment can identify some other safety planning resources to help the, the target or the victim or the survivor in, in this case, even if Title IX doesn't have jurisdiction to, to run a full investigation or um, uh, you know, if, if campus police doesn't have a, a jurisdiction to, to run a, a, a criminal investigation, for example. Um, in under a minute, can you answer this? Should the various teams, CARE and BIT, use one assessment form during evaluations versus multiple forms such as NABIT A and Waiver 21? And my apologies if I've mispronounced either of those forms. <laughs> So I think you meant Nabita and Waiver 21, which is fine. So um, I would say whoever really owns the assessment piece of it, if you've got multiple teams, um, it should it gets back to team scope. One team may actually be more actively engaged in threat assessment than the other. I would recommend doing one, gosh, you could do one universal screening form that could be used by your care team or your BIT team or your threat assessment team to figure out it in sort of if-then statements. If it looks like this, it belongs with care team. If it's the, these other things, it belongs with threat assessment. So you can have one form they use for screening, but then whoever is actually doing the threat assessment should do the threat assessment. So Waiver 21 is an excellent form to help threat assessment teams um, it, through a threat assessment process. So if you are going through the full threat assessment process and are trained to use the waiver, absolutely use the waiver, but I make sure you've, you've got the right team using the form and the right training behind it. Thanks very much, Marisa, and thanks to all of our viewers and questioners from around the Internet. Check the NCCPS webinars page in the next week or so for a link to the captioned recording of today's presentation, as well as a link to our speaker slides. The brief evaluation survey that I mentioned earlier should already be in your mailbox. It will take you no more than two minutes to complete. Please do reread and act on your comments. 
We won't be having a webinar in December, and so the next Campus Public Safety Online is next year on Tuesday, January 22nd, 2019. This will be another 90-minute webinar running from 2 to 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time, focusing on the National Police Foundation's project on averted school violence. The session title is The Importance of Learning from Averted and Completed School Attacks. And our speakers will be Frank Straub from the National Police Foundation, Jeff Allison of IACLEA, and Christina Anderson, a survivor of the Virginia Tech shooting and founder of the Koshka Foundation for Safe Schools. Watch your email for registration information or check the National Center webpage at nccpsafety.org. That's nccpsafety.org. Campus Public Safety Online is brought to you by the National Center for Campus Public Safety with support from the University of Vermont Continuing and Distance Education and the U.S. Department of Justice. Special thanks today to Andrea Young and Dan Cardella. This is Steve Warona. See you next year on Campus Public Safety Online.